Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you to you in the room. Thank you to you watching us live online. This is the fifth and final issue briefing of today. I sometimes almost think we've left the most important issues to day three. We've dealt with inequality this morning. We've dealt with climate change. And I think another one, ethics and corporate governance, is the subject of this session. Those of you unfamiliar with the format will know it's short and compact. We have 30 minutes for this reason, this reason alone. I'll keep my remarks to a minimum. But we're here to talk about how high ethical standards become, can become more commonplace in business and what the role of corporate governance is in ensuring this. Essentially, what we want to know is whether in 2016 corporate governance can serve all stakeholders equally. Now, my panel are two esteemed experts and leaders in, the, in their own fields. Barbara Novick, Vice Chairman, BlackRock Investments, USA. Lucy Marcus, a columnist at BBC and also a member of a number of boards in her own right. I get a two for one here, a member of the media, um, a vocal columnist who writes on the subject avidly and is also an insider too. Lucy, I'd like to start with you first, if I may, and just ask you to explore the macro view on the narrative that's emerging in corporate governance, how things are moving. Are they moving too slowly or too fast? Well, it's hard to judge whether they're moving too slowly or, or too fast. It probably is good to give it some context, which is um, sort of five years ago, ten years ago, you wouldn't have even been having this conversation in an open room, necessarily. The boardroom tends to be a fairly black box room, uh, fairly opaque, and, you know, board members we sort of keep to ourselves. We, you know, we go into a room, the doors close, and people don't know necessarily what we're doing, and they're not familiar with what a boardroom does. But more and more we see boardroom issues on the front page of uh, not just financial papers, but you know, in, the, in the business section and other sections of, uh, of regular newspapers, if anyone reads newspapers as much, or at least digital. Um, I hope they still do. I hope so too. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, one of the things that's, that's happened is um, there has been more clarity, more transparency, more bringing of these issues out into the world, because for a long time, we existed in something that was more like the cult of the CEO, where everyone thought the CEO is the head of the company and everything they do and say is what exactly happens. But who hires the CEO? Who fires the CEO? Who, um, who meets with the CEO on a regular basis? Who holds the company in check? And so um, it becomes clear and clear that we have to understand better what happens in this black box room. And that has been very powerful. In, and, and, and a number of things have happened to propel that. Um, social media actually has been a part of that, you know, where issues start to rise to the fore and people think, who's making a difference, what should be happening about that, and we realize actually it's the boardroom. Um, board members are getting more and more held to account for what we do and what we say. And I know that as a board member, my job has changed over the past several years. Um, you know, it's no longer good enough to skim the papers and, you know, fly in, ask a couple of questions, have a slap up lunch and go home. We now must engage more because it's our job to ask the hard questions and make sure that we're holding the company to account, both on the stargazing side, what happens in the distance and strategic side, and also on the grounding side, which is the sort of tick boxy stuff to make sure that the company is following the rules, that they are following the law, and so on. So um, a, there's been a huge shift in uh, how the world sees companies, how the world sees uh, the role of the board, and also holding the board to account. So things were opaque, but are they now transparent? They're not transparent yet, but what's, what has been very important is that uh, investors who, um, who have in their own right begun to think about things that are important to them like uh, climate change or diversity or, or any myriad of them issues, they're the ones actually who help to, to push through change as well because what it means is uh, if, if a, a, a large pension fund decides that they want to decarbonize uh, their portfolio, then they have two ways of doing it. They can either just say, okay, we're decarbonizing, they just walk away from anything that they think is toxic of a sort in, within their portfolio, and all of a sudden there it is. And apparently, I was hearing last night actually here in Davos that someone was talking about doing that and that they said that when they had decarbonized their portfolio by walking away and investing in things that were more within what they wanted, that not only had their, their their, their portfolio stayed not just the same, but actually had increased in value. So that's a good thing. Um, and the other way is for, uh, for investors to engage. So uh, rather than walking away, try to pressure or move the, the needle in some way to get a company or the portfolio of companies to think more carefully about things like climate or diversity. Thank you, Lucy. Barbara, to what degree is corporate governance a factor when you're 
weighing your investment decisions? You're one of the largest investors in the USA. Right. So it's very important when you're thinking about asset management companies to understand the business mix of the products that they offer to be able to even answer that question. Um, so for example, at BlackRock, more than half, in fact, a very large percentage of the equity assets we manage are in what's called passive products or index strategies. So what does that mean? It means that if it's in the index, we're going to own it. And we're not in the position to say, we like your governance, we don't like your governance, we're going to sell you if we don't like your governance. As a result, we feel a, an even stronger obligation to engage. And as Lucy said, you know, it's not a, a black and white. There's a, a, a very active strategy you can take, which is engaging with companies on issues that you have concerns about, asking hard questions so that you're not waiting for the proxy, you're not getting to the end of a process and then voting against. You can always hold that cord, but rather than take that as your primary approach, um, we've insourced all of the uh, proxy voting, essentially. We don't outsource it. Um, and we in take engagement quite seriously. I think last year alone, we engaged with 1,500 companies and voted 15,000 proxies. So it gives you some perspective. So very important issues, um, but how you go about it can differ from one company to another. What, is that, what is that exactly do you look for when you're conducting your due diligence in this field? I would say the primary thing is the board. Right. At the end of the day, the board members are there <coughs> to protect the shareholders. Um, and they should be thinking about long-term value. So whether it's making sure you have board members who have the right expertise, um, board members who have the right time, as mm, Lucy yeah. said, the time commitment today is different than maybe it was five and 10 years ago, and mm. certainly 20 years ago. Um, you know, can, can they de devote that time? And do they have, I'll say, the, the will um, the strong will mm -hmm. to make hard decisions. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for hiring and firing um, the CEO. They are responsible for certain decisions of the company, either approving them or being involved in them in some way. And they're the eyes and ears on a regular basis on behalf of the shareholders. So the quality of the board is probably the number one issue. Um, and then the number two issue, I think, would be as you engage with companies over time, whether it's through due diligence or, or you know, direct engagement um, of whatever sort, you, do they have a long-term vision? You know, what is their long-term strategy? How, can, how do they express it? How do they measure themselves against it? Are they thinking about the different stakeholders? Right? Are they thinking just about how do I maximize profit this quarter? Or are they thinking about the long-term? You know, are we factoring in our employees? Are we factoring in our clients? Are we factoring in um, you know, the regulatory environment? Are we factoring in tech changes? What are we thinking about as a company? And is it a long-term thinking? Because otherwise you have you know, a very short-term profit maxi maximization, which may not be in sync with the portfolios that we hold. That's why I started with, mm. as an investor, we're going to hold those companies we're in it for the long term. We want to make sure they're in it for the long term. Mm. And when things start to go wrong and corporate governance isn't up to the levels you expect, what can you do? How can you assert leverage on a business? And are you asserting any leverage on a business? From a, I guess, a style perspective, primarily we engage. Um, so sometimes people track the numbers. How often did you vote with management? How often did you vote against management? We don't look at it as black and white. We can vote against management. We would much rather engage, have our issues addressed, and more often than not be voting with management because they've already addressed their issues or they've committed to addressing them in the future. Um, so I don't think the simplistic looking at someone's numbers is going to tell you the whole story. And from a style perspective, we would much rather be in the room with somebody having the conversation. We think you actually move the needle more that way than having a, a public spat. Mm. And we see activism in increasing generally amongst shareholders in general. Is this the best way to address corporate governance? Um, 
<laughs> well, I don't know that activism is necessarily targeted to corporate governance. No. Um, I think some activism is targeted to short-term profit motives. Some activism is targeted to perhaps um, a longer-term vision. But it's effective it, it, in short term as well. So could it be used? Could, could, could the tactics of the activist investor be employed mm. to assert authority and leverage to, to, to shape up and, and improve corporate mm. governance structures? I think you had a view on that in the green room. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it depends on, on how you define activism. Um, I think that there, there, there are a couple of different ways of looking at it. Um, as a board member, one of the positive things about activism, and most, and most board members actually are, you know, sort of scared witless of it. I mean, they, they, to them it means, you know, something bad is going to happen. But actually for me, you know, my job as a board member is, a, is to ask hard questions. You sort of, your job is to love the business enough, like almost like a parent, you love them enough to ask them hard questions and demand more of them because you want them to do well. And, uh, and so it's the same sort of thing as a board member. You ha it's your job to ask hard questions and it can be uncomfortable sometimes. You, you could be the thing that stands between, you know, the board meeting finishing and lunch, you know, but you have to be strong enough and stand there because it's your job. And you have to remember every time you walk in the door that that's what your job is. And so um, what activism does, anytime something goes wrong, when you have a, a, a Sony hacking or a FIFA situation, God forbid, or a, you know, a corruption, I mean, uh, we were hearing about that today from, uh, I think it was Al Gore was talking about the, the cost of corruption. Uh, it's enormous. And so all of these things, when something happens, it's an impetus to help board members as well go in and say, are we going to be the next Sony? Are we, are we vulnerable? Well, the same thing with the threat of activism in a way, which is rather than going, oh, we have to do everything we can to make it look like our business is doing well. That's not going to work. It's we have to make sure that our business is doing well. And when you have a situation like a VW, where you have a, a, a board that was fairly insular and not well structured and not communicating and not asking hard questions, you know, where were the investors then? not doing enough and where are the board members who are on there who are independent not doing enough and so that's a cautionary tale now for those of us who are board members and for those who are investors to say you don't want to be the next vw you and you certainly don't want to be associated with something like a fifa and what's interesting about that as well is the risk report that came out from the world economic forum um, just uh, just a, a week or so again uh, listed all the risks that businesses have to worry about climate change, and refugee crisis, and so it was all really important things. But actually, if you look at our world of business and you look back at the past <coughs> year or so, the big stories about what went wrong were nowhere on that list of risks. It's implosion. It's things going wrong in the business. It's corporate governance. It's ethics, the topic that we're here for. It's, it's being robust enough in the businesses. And so it's a sort of combination work of those of us who sit on boards and those who are invested in companies to hold companies account to do, we have something in common. We want to build better, stronger businesses because if you have better, stronger businesses, you have better, stronger economies and everybody does better. So instead of seeing it as uh, something that is bad for a business and something you should be afraid of, it actually can be very positive. And if you have an investor who you can partner with, so to speak, and who works with you and says, we're looking at you, we're looking at you objectively, we're, we're comparing you like with like with other companies, and you have a problem, let us help you, or let us encourage you kindly or not so kindly, that's good for business in the long term, as uncomfortable as it may be. Right, but I also think it's important to realize or recognize you can't legislate ethics, right? It's sort of in the necessary but not sufficient category. Mm -hmm. You need to have rules, you need to have some baseline, you need to have some guidelines. But ethics is a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. It's personal to a company, it's mm -hmm. personal to the individuals mm -hmm. at the company. Employees see what the leaders do. Yeah. They so right. hear the messages. If the message that's reinforced over and over again is integrity counts, mm. we care and about it's rewarded, ethics. right? It's rewarded. Yeah, right. You know, it's part of your review process. It's part of your employee um, satisfaction survey. Mm. It's part of any you know town halls or group meetings. Mm. Like if that becomes just ingrained in the mm. culture, mm. 
that's very different than saying somebody legislated mm. that you have five meetings a year mm. or that you take the ethics training yeah. once a year. Yeah. And so many of the things that have gone wrong, as Lucy said, are ethics issues mm. that you, there's no way to legislate ethics. Mm. But you can, I, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. I think rules help. Rules are our friend in a way, which I, I think a lot of people would disagree with me, but also as a, you know, again, I like to be able to point to something and say, we have to do it because it's there, which makes it easier in a way to say that. But also, you know, there's all this stuff about um, in the corporate governance community as well as saying, you know, as, as sort of people outside the boardroom saying, well, there's the rules, they should do it. But when you're in the boardroom, it is the most human room I've ever been in. Everybody brings their baggage. It's really about uh, the chemistry of the people around it. I could chair a, a room, this room full of people, you could chair this room full of people, and the outcome would be completely different because the chair sets the tone of the meeting, which is also one of the reasons that I'm a big fan of separating chair and CEO, a conversation for another day, but still. Um, but I think, you know, things like that, it, it is, it becomes, the personal becomes the professional. You're right. And, and you can't say, we need to look like a better company. We need to look like we're doing better. You just need to do better. Right, but I guess my point would be a mechanical check the box, right? We create so many rules that yeah. the only thing the board and has time owners. to do mm -hmm. yeah. is make sure we've check, 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 tick, yeah. tick, tick. Yeah. That's not mm -hmm. good yeah. governance, yeah. right? So yes, encouraging good ethics. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, embedding that in your culture. Great idea. Mm -hmm. Making a rule for that? I don't even know what that rule would look yeah. like. And saying, you know, annual mandatory compliance training. You know, those are good things to have. Mm -hmm. Necessary, but mm -hmm. not sufficient. Okay. So yeah. they are good. With my you, risk hat on, though, I really like them. <laughs> I mean, we have to, I mean, you have to do it in a way. And, it, and, and in financial services, it's even more onerous. It's true. But it's, it's trying to fix a, something that's broken. And you're right, it's difficult, but if, if we do nothing, ooh, it's, it's This is an interesting conversation, so it's, it's rules and, and values, isn't it? So yeah. Barbara, give us your insight. You work with loads of companies, and as you say, you engage in cast votes, and you have a, a, a view on a lot of these decisions personally. Are you satisfied with the level, you know, the, the values of the, of the boardroom and the companies that, that you engage with? Um, it's certainly, um, you know, we have some examples, <laughs> recent yeah. examples of, sure. of some spectacular failures on that count. Um, but we also have many, many success stories. So I don't think you can tarnish whole industries or you know whole sets of companies. I think it is very company specific. I would look again to the leadership, the tone at the top, their actions, not just their words. You know, are they emphasizing short-term profits? Are they emphasizing cutting corners? Because if they are at the top, you know that that's what's going to filter yeah. down. Yeah. If they're saying, let's be more patient, let's be more long-term, let's make sure ethics, and mm -hmm. ethics can be a lot of things. Ethics can be, you know, what kind of community member are you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes. looking more holistically mm -hmm. at, I think somebody said, do, doing good, not just doing well. Right, right? that's right. Mm -hmm. And making sure that you're really taking into account multiple stakeholders and thinking about the, the company holistically. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. It seems a good juncture to see if there are any questions from the floor. Okay. So, microphone on its way to you. Oh. Um, uh, Paul Britz from Deutsche Welle. Um, you were talking about VW earlier and I can't resist um, <laughs> asking about that. Um, you stressed the importance of, of, uh, of the board um, in terms of uh, you know government uh, uh, corporate uh, ethics, um, but as we've seen often enough, the board isn't isn't um, helpful in preventing these uh, these uh, things to happen. So what what is going wrong? And on the other hand, um, uh, how can how can corporations you know that have gone by a certain culture for a long time, like VW? actually um, get that change done and get it done quickly because they need to move quickly. So this is the early warning system. How mm. can you s see a crisis before it happens? Mm. And then when you do see it, how can you, how can you do something about it? Well, I think there's the general answer, which is every time there is a scandal, whether it's an accounting scandal, a regulatory issue, whatever, it's a wake-up call I think for all boards, mm. right? If you're in the boardroom, you think about can that happen here? Mm. How, you know, 
are we encouraging this? Are we putting in checks and balances? Like, it, it's got to be something that's talked about, mm -hmm. I'd say, pretty widely. Um, so you would hope that th the, the general answer is people wake up and they look at these things in their own, you know, they look in the mirror and they say, for our own company, mm -hmm. what things should we be doing? Mm -hmm. Now, that's not going to always be the case. I see you mm -hmm. smiling. Yeah. But I think that's where it has to start. Mm -hmm. And I think there is some more and more, I think there is introspection mm -hmm. about these issues as there's more focus mm -hmm. on corporate governance uh, in general. Yeah, all good points. I think there are a couple of things that when, um, you know, the role of a board member is, what, what, what I say is it's to be hands-on but not hands-in. So you actually have to have a real sense of the business and what's going on. We cannot, we're not executives. We, can't, we can make decisions, but we cannot execute those decisions. And if you don't have a, a chief executive and a team that can execute those decisions, then you have to get a new chief executive and a new executive team. So you need to have that in accord and you need to have a, a certain balance there. The other thing is, it is very important to make sure that, you know, uh, whoever was talking about this, that you need to have the right people around the table. They need to be engaged. Um, you don't want people who are overboarded, who are sitting on too many boards, because it's just impossible these days to, to read all the papers, keep track of everything. You want to make sure that the board is well educated, because the world is changing on a constant basis. And, you know, one of the companies that I sit on is a, a large company. It's a com it has a lot of complexity to it. They do induction sessions four times a year to, to, to go deep on various parts of the business so we understand it better, so that we can be better. But it's also my job as a board member to educate myself. I cannot be happy with just the beautiful, massaged board books, the pablum that is fed to me so easily. It's also my job to go out, understand the sector, understand what's going on, ask questions, teach myself so that when I ask a question and the answer comes back, my intuition, even if it's not in my particular area or of understanding, my intuition now tells me, is this right? Is this wrong? And so it's, you know, and also this sort of um, the education of board members and, and, and constantly how are we doing as board members? What do we need to know? What's changed? What's our responsibility? So, I mean, I think I've been to a uh, hundred off-sites in the past year where I go and talk to boards about, you know, sort of what's happening in the world of boards and what's changing. And it's easy for me in a way because I'm like, a, I'm, I'm a board member, you're a board member, so I'm not trying to, you know, say something that I wouldn't say myself. But even as a board member, I have to remind myself constantly not to get um, uh, complacent and to keep asking. Because also, there, I, I'm a fan of term limits as well. That if you stay on a board for too long, and, and in the US, n there's, it's not so popular term limits. And, the, and a lot of times you have people staying on a board, they leave the way the old popes used to, feet first. You know? and so, but, but actually, the, in Europe, we have a system of uh, somewhere around nine years that um, gives you enough time to get up to speed quickly, be effective, and then step off before you, you know, sort of grow to love it so much that you can't bear to see it change. And that refreshment is very important. And I would also add, um, if you're a board member, one of the key risks is reputation risk. Yes. Right? And in a world where information is so readily available mm -hmm. and travels so quickly, mm -hmm. there's no secrets anymore. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, this whole conference, the WEF is about the, you know, the next transformation, et cetera. I mean, the, the speed at which information travels mm. and the absolute inability to hide anything, yeah. right? It's on a blog, it's, there's a whistleblower, whatever. Mm. The, everything, social internal media. or external, mm. it's on social, it's yeah. everywhere. Mm. So reputation risk is a very real mm. issue mm. and it's probably a bigger issue today because of that speed of information and, and availability of information. Yeah. So I would think as a board member, you've got to be thinking about yeah. that. and. Do we have a program in place? Are we sending the right message from that top down? That's absolutely right. Let's just go back to that. And something you said earlier on, Barbara, <coughs> for the last few minutes of this session, you mentioned you can't pinpoint any one company or, or industry. But as you said also, the theme of this meeting is the fourth industrial revolution, which is throwing up dizzying opportunities for reputational risk and, and new a areas of science, which could become minefields or danger, danger zones. Do you foresee any particular challenges with the, you know, the current um, speed of change in technology that we ought to be aware of and, and mindful of? 
Oh my. <laughs> you want me to jump in on that or you want to go first? Well, certainly, <laughs> uh, you know, cyber issues, yeah. um, it would be hard not to be cognizant of and concerned mm -hmm. about. I mean, the Sony hacking is a great example, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you, you just, I think there's no way you can't invest very heavily, whether it's your business continuity or it's your trade secrets. And, and um, it, it's just so many ways you can be attacked. Mm. I, I think you have to be I very cognizant of that. I would there are industries that are more, yeah. more prone, maybe the data, data, for example, and, and, yeah. and, and lack of clarity over, over, over data and how it's used or misused or, 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 or spread online mm -hmm. and whether markets are, are, are pricing that in in their investment decisions, whether mm -hmm. there are industries that are seen as at risk for, mm -hmm. for future corporate governance um, issues. Uh, well, I, I guess I would take the question, I, I would step back from a little bit because you know, one of the things that I've, I've written about and talked about is this question of what's an industry? So, I mean, there is no industry that isn't touched in some way, changed in some way, moved in some way by technology. And also, you know, is Apple a technology company or is it a watch company or a car company or, you know, what is it? What is Google? Is it a search company? Is it a data company? Is it a car company? Is everybody a car company now? You know, are they a music company? So one of the things is, and, it, and analysts are finding it very difficult to classify as well, is you can no longer say that a company is in a particular sector. And what that means is that everybody's a technology company and everybody's something else. And um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece is the security piece. And you know, there are regulations about what you have to do, particularly in Europe, we have you know, data protection and all of that stuff. And um, you know, in every company, I mean, you know, uh, infrastructure company that deals with highways and airports, we hold a lot of data. It's our job to be exceptionally good about taking care of it. And you need people around the board table who, they don't necessarily have to be technology experts because there's a lot of demand for, we need someone in the boardroom who has a tech, who's a tech expert. But, it, but rather what you need is people who understand the changing nature of what's happening in the world. And they need to understand and help companies think through and challenge companies and question companies, are you protecting your data? Are you thinking about the implications of this for your business? Do you understand social media? You don't have to be a social media expert, but you know, but even someone like me who I adore social media, but I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I but I understand and I understand the cadence of it, and I think that's important because that influences business. So what we need is a much more holistic understanding of how everything is changing, which is very much this fourth industrial sort of thing. And also what we need to protect for it, what we need to see as an opportunity for it. And that's asking a lot of a board, actually. But if you pull together enough people and you don't, instead of having a tick box saying, if we need five CEOs or, you know, if you have a boardroom filled with, you know, six Scottish accountants who went to Cambridge and Eton, that's not diversity. They all might be very skilled, but you need people around the table who, you need gender diversity, but you also need age diversity. You need, all, you know, you just need people around the table who can ask the hard questions and something better will always come of a, a conversation amongst people from different backgrounds. I also think there's, with technology, new products, some of which we don't even know what they're going to be, right? So whenever there's new products, there's always new issues. So I'll give two examples. Driverless cars. Mm. If they crash, who's responsible? Mm. Who's liable? Mm. The, the poor insurance agents. Right? Uh, what what uh, happens if somebody's yeah. injured? Yeah. Right? And, and what's acceptable? As a parent, can you, can you put your little kids in a driverless car and they're off on their own driving around somewhere because <laughs> they, have to get, they have to get to their music lesson or their play day? I mean, think about that. You know, two, two little five-year-olds in the backseat of a driverless car, is that allowed or not allowed? That can't and, be good for all kinds of reasons. Right, but, <laughs> but that's my point is there, it, it brings up new questions that we've never even thought about hmm. because there were no driverless cars that wasn't even an option you know drones delivering your packages mm. right <coughs> well yeah. what if that drone runs into another drone what if that drone you know creates some problem with air traffic exactly. what if that drone is like next to you know kennedy airport mm. right so i think the question for technology and in this next revolution is how do you even Think about mm. the questions mm. with new products, new services, whether they're ethical things in biotechnology yeah. or they're practical things in, in some of these product-oriented mm. mm. you know, solutions. It, it, it's, 
I don't even know the no. questions to ask. Yeah. And I think it's a advance. really great point. And, w and one of the things that it, it, it reminds me of as well is uh, something I wrote about a, uh, several months ago, which is um, a lot of these companies, they're enamored by the technology and they're developing the technology, but there's no counterpoint. They don't have boards. They're so y uh, young, uh, early stage startups. Nobody's there saying, you know, that's great, that sounds exciting. Have you thought about the ethics of that? Or have you thought about uh, data protection? Or have you thought about, you know, the, it's not every man for themselves. You, you know, if you're an Uber or something, there are issues that come along with every change and you need to be able to counter that and say, it's fantastic, that's great, but there are some issues and we need to think about those as well. And you can't just ram your way through, you know, there's legislation for a reason. There's taxi regulation for a reason. It's not necessarily, you know, it's something that you can't overcome or do something with, but everything we're doing also challenges the way we work as a society. So nothing is developed in a, in a, in a vacuum. And you're right, the knock-on effects of, you know, choices that are made or new developments, I don't want to slow it down. I just want us to be cognizant. And it's much better to be asking those questions in the boardroom, which is a relatively safe place to have a hard conversation, than for it to go out and someone gets hurt, and then we're asking it in the world and we're having to clean up something. So you'd rather have a board that challenges you, because a lot of, you know, CEOs, I've met some of them here, are like, ah, oh, the board, it's such a pain. The board can be your friend. It can be the thing that saves you from having mistakes that are costly and problematic. Which people will always say in the rearview mirror, of course that was a problem. Why didn't you think <laughs> exactly. of it? Right? So you do want the board to ask yeah. those hard questions yeah. and to be thinking about the long-term yeah. value and yeah. making sure various things are factored in. Which is why Barbara looks at the boards to make sure that they're that they're qualified to, to do all that stuff because because she's not going to be there all the time to make sure so somebody has to also take care of that. It's about values, isn't it, Barbara? It's about rules, Lucy. It's a, a blend of both. It's about improving fast. The black box is no longer with us, but we're not yet at transparency. Mm. We're not satisfied yet. We have to ask the right questions, whatever they may be. We have to figure out what the questions are. Seems like a fitting place to end this session with overtime, and that's a cardinal sin in Swiss <laughs> terms. I hope we can talk about it again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank this you. session Thank is you. now over.